Welcome to the next lecture. Uh, we're talking about Buddhist art in South Asia. So the story and the teachings of the Buddha. I actually have a cute little kitty video. <laughs> That's the story of Siddhartha. Um, and it's made for kids, but I think it's actually pretty effective. So I'll put that in the description for the video. So Siddhartha Gautama is a historical figure um, in the same way that, that Jesus is a historical figure. Uh, we don't have uh, contemporary records from these figures, but they're assumed to exist based on um, all the recordings of what they had said and such. Um, so he was the son of Queen Maya uh, and the king, whose name I don't pronounce, in present day Nepal. Uh, we'll talk about Nepal a little bit later on. He's also known as Shakyamuni, uh, which means the sage or lion of the Shakya clan. Uh, so that story of the Buddha video, um, again, I'll put that in the description for this one. So suffering in the Eightfold Path. Um, so before he gets to that, actually, I'll kind of like summarize the story of the Buddha um, so you can orient yourself to what's going on. So Buddha had grown up um, as a prince, um, and he, uh, his parents had this idea that they would insulate him from all of the bad things in the world. Uh, so they decided when he was born that he would never see um, anyone that was unhealthy. He would never see anyone in poverty. Uh, he would never see anyone that's old. Um, everything that would be surrounding him would be beautiful and young and healthy. Um, and their idea was is to um, make him into something kind of special. When he was born, um, there was, you know, kind of like a, a uh, prediction, I guess you could say, uh, about what he would do. He would either become a great king or he would become a great spiritual leader. So um, obviously he became a great spiritual leader, but later on we'll talk about the Jatakas, the story of the Buddha in his past lives where he was kings and princes and such. Um, so his parents were pretty successful, but when he got into his um, late teen years, he said that he wanted to leave um, the walls of the palace, because that's how they've been keeping, you know, all the sickness and things away from him. So um, they were really concerned, his parents. They were worried that he would see things that they didn't want him to see. So what they did is kind of like they do for the Olympics. Uh, they cleared the streets of everybody that was poor, uh, everybody that was old, um, and everybody that was sick. Um, and they arranged a parade. And he paraded through the town and um, it worked. You know, he looked around and he's like, wow, you know, this is just like inside the palace walls. Everybody's happy and shiny, um, like the REM song. And that worked at first, but then he saw in the crowd somebody they had missed, an old man who was wrinkly and stooped over and missing most of his teeth. And that's when Siddhartha realized that there was suffering in the world. So he went on a quest to find what the source of suffering is. Uh, and mind you, he's starting with the idea of Maya from Hinduism, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, he's starting with the idea that the material world is an illusion. Um, so he's not just looking for physical suffering, he's looking for spiritual suffering. Uh, so what he comes up with is the suffering and the eightfold path. And um, he presents this to his followers in the deer park at Sarnath. Um, but the lead up to that, I should actually go back to that. Um, when he goes on this quest, he goes and seeks the great spiritual leaders. Um, and each of them says, you should do this and then you'll reach enlightenment. You should do this and then you'll reach enlightenment. Um, so Siddhartha would do that. Uh, he would, if the person said fast, 
He would fast so much better than anyone ever fasted before. He was just skin and bones. Uh, we're going to see a portrayal of this. If the great spiritual leader said he should eat as much as possible, he got super fat, fatter than anyone. Uh, but he found that these things didn't work for him. Um, so when he did develop the source of suffering uh, and share it to his followers, uh, it kind of went like this. There's a middle path, a path which opens the eyes and bestows understanding, which leads to peace of mind, to the higher wisdom, to full enlightenment. What is the middle path? Verily, it is this noble eightfold path. That is to say, right views, right aspirations, right speech, right conduct, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right contemplation. This is the truth concerning suffering. Birth is attended with pain, decay is painful, disease is painful, death is painful, union with the unpleasant is painful, separation from the pleasant is painful. These six aggregates which spring from attachment are painful. This is the truth concerning the origin of suffering. It is the thirst accompanied by starving after a gratification or success in this life or the craving for a future life. This is the truth concerning the destruction of suffering. It is the destruction of this very thirst, the harboring no longer of this thirst. And now this knowledge and this insight has arisen within me. Immovable is the emancipation of my heart. This is my last existence. There will be no rebirth for me. Um, so that says that he um, reached nirvana. Um, and he was able to es escape um, the circle of samsara, which is uh, reincarnation, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, so in this, he talks about what the truth is, and he says it springs from attachment. Um, and he says that the problem and what, what we have to eliminate is desire. Um, so these are some of the themes that you'll see a lot in uh, the artwork that is related to him. So he talks about karma in the wheel of existence. Um, so going back to Hinduism, um, but it, you know, it made its way into Buddhism as well, there's an idea that um, you have the Atman, and that is your permanent soul. And then you have samsara, which is the circle of reincarnation and death. Um, so the idea is, is that if you accumulate some good karma on your Atman in one life, in the next life, you'll go to a better place. So um, say you were a poor person and you accumulated, got a lot of good actions on your, on your Atman, um, then you would move up um, and perhaps be a Brahmin or um, at least a person that's a little bit well, more well off. Um, so for Buddha, the idea was to escape this wheel of existence. Uh, and again, by doing that, by reaching enlightenment, um, by avoiding attachment uh, and avoiding desire. So only an individual can reach enlightenment on their own. No helps from gods or saints. And that's what you get straight from um, Siddhartha himself. Uh, and we call that... Um, very, I guess you could say originalist in a way, on conception of Buddhism, Veda, which means the teaching of the elders. Um, it's also known as Hinayana, the lesser vehicle. And when they say lesser, they don't mean less important or less effective. They just mean that it's less complex. Um, so we had already seen a lot of Mahayana Buddhism um, with bodhisattvas and, and such. So that's just a more complex way of thinking of things. Um, the lesser vehicle doesn't mean um, lesser and greater as in good or better or worse or something like that. So this type of Buddhism is not the most common Buddhism around the world, although it is most commonly practiced in Sri Lanka, in Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Um, and a lot of what I learned about Buddhism um, as a graduate and an undergrad uh, came from people that learned in some of these traditions. Um, so definitely kind of helpful to think about. So the greater vehicle develops in the first century CE. And in a way, this is kind of syncretic. Um, they take the concepts from Buddhism 
um, and mix them with other concepts, maybe with a local religion like you would see in Tibet, um, or just with ideas of, of people that can help you like you see with, with bodhisattvas and such. Um, and in this conception, the Buddha is divine and also strive to Buddhahood. In that way, um, it can be somewhat less complex um, because the lesser vehicle is talking about individual enlightenment, which takes a lot of kind of self-examination work. Whereas some forms that we had talked about before, Mahayana Buddhism, um, you just simply have to uh, express your faith um, in the Buddha, the divine Buddha, and you can reach enlightenment that way. So bodhisattvas, those who have enlightenment, they delay nirvana to help others reach enlightenment. Um, and as I talked bef about before, when we had talked about bodhisattvas, a lot of them were thought to be wealthy people and are sometimes portrayed as wealthy people. There's also Buddhas of the past, the present, and the future. In Tibetan Buddhism, which we'll talk about later on, that can get quite complex into the uh, tens of thousands of Buddhas and bodhisattvas. So really great for the artists. So the Maurya period um, is about 322 to 185 BCE. And even though Buddha is living quite a, a bit before this, um, this is the first uh, kind of polity, like, like an empire or a kingdom or something like that, uh, that embraces Buddhism. Um, and it's coming from the top, but you know, there's, there's already people who are interested in Buddhism before this. So just to give a little background so we can understand why the art looks the way it does, uh, the Greeks invaded from 327 to 326 BCE. Uh, this is in a Greek history class. We don't have to get into it too much. Uh, but there was a population in Gandhara um, of Greeks and then later Romans that were left over. Uh, and they had certain artistic traditions that were influential um, in South Asia. So Chandragupta Maurya founds the dynasty in about 323 BC, so pretty much right afterwards. Um, and his grandson, his grandson Ashaka, who ruled from about 273 to 232, converted to Buddhism and was probably the first uh, ruler to commission Buddhist artworks. Um, so Ashaka had a big influence on some types of Buddhist industry uh, imagery. So this is the lion capital of a column erected by our Emperor Ashaka. And as you can see, the capital has four lions facing in different directions. Uh, it has a wheel that represents the wheel of law, the Buddha, and then it has a lotus. So the lotus is an important plant um, to Buddhists because of a lotus generally, grow, well, as far as I know, it always grows in the mud. So it's from this kind of like profane area. And then when it blossoms, it has these delicate and beautiful flowers. So Buddhists can kind of see that as their trip to enlightenment. They start out as profane, uh, these spiritual beings in this Maya existence, uh, but then they can eventually reach enlightenment um, and have this beautiful kind of delicacy that nirvana would be. So you may recognize these lion faces. They're a little bit cuter, um, but... Right here, we can see the flag of India and then the emblem of India. So the country of India is mostly Hindu. Uh, there's very few Buddhists in India, but um, the Buddha is still influential. Uh, so you can see that when India became independent from the British Empire in 1948, uh, they chose this symbol. Um, so there's definitely, even though the religion by most people is Hinduism or Islam, um, the kind of influence of Buddhist culture still exists, and um, the modern Indian state wanted to celebrate that. So some of the um, possible antecedents or influences to this are these Achaemenid, uh, that's a empire, ancient Persian empire, uh, and Persepolis, and you can see how they have a similar idea with a couple of animals on top of a capital. So it's a capital that's symbolic, it's not holding anything up. Um, other than the sculptures, uh, and facing in different directions. And when you see some of the lions they have there, not as cute, a little bit more fierce uh, than what we saw 
in um, the capital of Oshaka, but you can see similar sorts of, sorts of conventions that don't necessarily match what a lion looks like uh, as far as like, you know, the kind of like whisker area here, um, but do match both artworks. Um, so it's generally thought that there was a pretty big influence on this, and that would make sense. Uh, the Greeks were influenced by Persian culture, uh, so they would have brought that influence um, to India as well. So the lion, the reason why that's used to represent the Buddha is the Shakyamuni, the sage of the Shakya clan. Um, the wheel of law was once supported by lions, and I'll show you a reproduction of that a little bit later on. The rider's horse also represents the Buddha and the lotus as well. So in these early um, Buddhist images, there are no images of the physical Buddha. There's only icons. Um, so these, uh, this is kind of like, anti-personal imagery. Uh, instead, it's thought that the message of the Buddha is more important than the physical form of the Buddha. Um, so there's almost a little bit of a taboo against portraying Buddha at first in the earliest imagery. Um, and this, is, this comes from the way that you would think of Theravada Buddhism. And if you read what we know of, of what the Buddha himself said, uh, it kind of makes sense why they won't, wouldn't want to venerate the personage of the Buddha. So this is the great stupa in Sanchi, India. And there's a lot of great stupas, <laughs> but this is the greatest of the great stupas. Uh, these, the form of the stupas, not necessarily the meaning, is derived by, from Moria burial mounds made for the wealthy. And the tradition is, is that after Buddha was cremated, his ashes were taken to eight localities, and they were enshrined in stupas, and Ashaka took those um, and distributed these remains even wider. So it's believed by some Buddhists that the actual remains of Siddhartha um, are inside of this, what is basically a reliquary. So you can't go inside and, and actually see the remains. Um, so this was originally built by Ashaka, uh, but there were a lot of changes since um, because some of the materials that Ashaka's people used were ephemeral. Uh, so some of those were changed to stone. Uh, and it becomes the Maha Stupa, which simply means the great stupa. So at the top of it, we have what's called the Chatra. It's a three-part umbrella. And like the lotus, it kind of represents um, not necessarily like an individual's trip, uh, but it represents um, a sort of hierarchy uh, that's leading to more and more sacred things. Uh, so at the top, we'd have the Buddha, then the Buddha Law, and the monastic order underneath that. It's supported by a hermika, which is a railing, a sacred tree with a railing. Um, and the idea with this is, is that uh, we'll see it with the outside fence as well. It separates the profane or more profane from the sacred. So the profane being things that are maya and the sacred being things that are eternal. So in the middle, we have the yasti, which is the mass, the axis of the universe. So uh, a stupa is kind of like a cosmological model of Buddhist thought in that way. Um, and they represent the kind of globe-like figure with the mast uh, to show that. Um, and in this area, this would be the realm of the gods. So again, a very sacred area as, as opposed to the profane area, so they're outside. So when you visit this stupa, it's a reliquary, and just like what we saw with Japanese um, Buddhist temples, uh, there's a path for a ritual clockwise rock uh, walk, and it's representing the path of life around the world mountain. It's a mandala, not a building. So a diagram of the cosmos, a diagram of the physical com cosmos, the spiritual cosmos, and a kind of thought cosmos as well. Um, so there you go, <laughs> if you get to go there. Uh, that's your way down from your clockwise walk. So this is called a vidikya, which means a railing. If you recognize this, and it looks very similar to what we saw in Japan, um, as I mentioned before, it's probably, uh, the Japanese ones are probably influenced by this. Um, and it's made of stone, which is permanent. Um, and again, it separates the sacred and the profane worlds. And it imitates the wooden slotted fence of Ashaka's original stupa. So some of the decorations um, on this may be more in line with what you see um, in later forms of Buddhism. So the Tarana, 
um, that's a gate. Uh, it points to the cardinal directions. It may have originally been of wood or softer stone, but we're not exactly sure with that one. So this is a Toronto detail, and the Buddha is shown multiple times here, but remember, the Buddha is not shown as a person. Uh, so if you look around, you can see the Wheel of Law right here. Um, you can see the lions. Uh, we see the lion capital, uh, Wheel of Law again, the Bodhi tree. That's the tree under which Buddha meditated when he was protected by a cobra, uh, and he re first reached enlightenment. And then you can see the Bodhi tree again, all of these riderless horses, um, all of these things that represent Buddhist ideas and the ideals of the Buddha. So in this one, uh, this tells a Jataka, a story about the Buddha. Um, and this particular Jataka is about Buddha as the king of the baboons. Uh, so whenever they talk about the stories of the past lives of the Buddha, um, he would often be uh, portrayed as a prince or some kind of great leader uh, amongst these people, but he's often sacrificing himself. And that's what happens in this story. Uh, so let's check it out. So the story told here is that of the Buddha when he was king of the monkeys. In this incantation, the Buddha-to-be had an enemy and his rival, his wicked cousin, Devidatta. The monkeys were attacked by archers of the king of Var Varanasi, and the Buddha-to-be stretched his huge simian frame from one side of the river to the other so monkeys could flee safe to safety across his body. But the last cross to cross was Devidatta, who thrust his foot down as he passed over and broke his cousin's back. The king had the Buddha to be bathed, rubbed with oil, clothed in yellow, and brought before him. You made yourself a bridge for them, the Passover. What are you to them, monkey, and what are they to you? The dying monkey replied, I, king, am lord of these bow beasts, and wheel have I brought to them over, over whom governance was mine, as all kings should. Therefore, the king of Varanasi ruled righteously and came at last to the bright world. Uh, so this is what you often see in the Jatakas, that in his previous lives, uh, he's basically functioning as a bodhisattva, uh, but almost like a maha bodhisattva, the bodhisattva of all bodhisattvas, um, greater than all the other ones. Um, so you can see they kind of emphasize his huge body here compared to the other monkeys. Um, and he saved their lives and wins the respect of enemies who then um, can move towards enlightenment. So these are yakshis um, and their tree goddess and they're pre-Buddhist, uh, so we have imagery that's kind of similar to this uh, in very ancient, even pre-Hinduism, perhaps. And they represent a bunch of different ideas, um, nature, water, and prana. Prana, so remember, prana is breath, a sacred breath. And um, they use a female figure that is quite bountiful, um, with very large breasts and wide hips, uh, and an emphasized vulva, uh, to show um, the kind of like, procreative, creative aspect of um, this particular goddess. So life to flowers and the fruit of the tree, they hang like fruit. Um, so if you want to be fruitful, it means you multiply, you're healthy, all of these sorts of things. Fecundity is a good way uh, to put it. Um, and the figure seems to be doing the Tribhanga, uh, the three bends pose, which if you've practiced Yoda, I'm sure yoga. <laughs> Yoga, you've done it before. Uh, and then they have male equivalents that are very similar. Uh, you know, instead of, instead of huge breasts and hips, they have huge penises, but the same idea, muscular, healthy, um, kind of representing um, procreative recreation. Uh, so looking at it from behind, again, you know, kind of like healthy and curvy and youthful, uh, purposely exaggerated in that way. So this is an exterior of a chaicha hall, uh, and chaicha halls are cut into living rock. So we'd saw these, seen these in the Wei Dynasty in China, uh, and this is probably the um, example that influenced uh, those particular types of um, living rock cut temples. So it's a Buddhist assembly hall, so they'd have these, they would be for real. Uh, they had wooden antecedents, 
uh, and they would enclose small stupas. Um, and they're carved to look like architecture. The caves are important. Uh, there's viharas, monk cells. So it's basically a model of the hall that monks, Buddhist monks would live in, uh, but it's made in stone. Uh, so there's about 1,200 in existence, and they are carved downward. So just, it was, was once uh, a hillside, and it's carved out of the rock that is there. So not a small job. You can see the front here, uh, and these once may have had more ephemeral pieces. Um, this would have been covered with a screen-like um, kind of structure, like we had talked about in the Wei Dynasty, uh, so that you would have the light kind of pouring through to the stupa in the middle. On the inside, uh, you would do a ritual walk around the stupa. Um, they have lotus capitals, remember again the meaning of that. Uh, these step platforms, perhaps uh, an influence from other places. Uh, matuna, which means couples, uh, and I'll show you a close-up of them in, 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 in a minute, but kind of like the yakshas and the yakshis, uh, they're representing this youthful kind of fecundity. Uh, they're riding horses and elephants, so um, fertility. I think even more than fertility, fecundity would be better. So human fertility and the ability to feed and, and keep everyone healthy. Uh, so when you get in close, again, quite bountiful figures, the men are the same way, uh, purposely exaggerated. Uh, I don't want you to think that you go to India and everyone's shaped like this. Um, they could represent nobility, giving respect to the Buddha instead of Matuna. We're not sure exactly, but either way, they do represent um, a similar type of idea uh, in relation to the Buddha. So side aisles to walk around the stupa. Again, it's a ritual kind of walk. Uh, there's the Chatra and the Yasti up there. Um, and the idea with these sorts of things, so their models, oh, and you can see the, the um, Ashaka's column out here with the Wheel of Law on it. Um, so the idea with this is that um, since the world is Maya, since the physical world isn't real, you can take a physical form and transfer it to anything else, just like we had seen with the Zen gardens in Japan. Uh, so rock can be like wood. So the real difference between this model of a Buddhist temple and stupa and um, the actual one that's used every day is um, almost irrelevant um, for that reason. So it's a way to illustrate that the world is an illusion. 